All right, we're continuing our series, A Portrait of a Healthy Church, and I want to give you just a little bit of a review of where we've been um, to help us to understand the foundation that we are building for a healthy church. Here's what we've discovered so far. God wants to do amazing things. That's who He is. He is a God that is amazing. And He loves to part the waters. He really does. And He loves to see people consecrated to Him. We want God to part the waters. We have to consecrate our life to Him. That is meaning to be devoted, to be set apart, to say to God, here I am, I'm available to you. There needs to be a focus on Jesus. We can't just say, God, do amazing things and then step back and do our own thing. We need to live a life that is focused on Jesus Christ. And then as Isaiah was our example, we need to listen and respond to the call of God in my life. Here I am, Lord, send me. Let me be the answer to my own prayer. Uh, I'm not going to wait for somebody else. I'm available. Here I am. I'm ready to do your will in my life. And then we began our 10-week series, and we have looked so far at these ingredients of a healthy church. First of all, a healthy church is a movement. It's not a building. However important the building is, it's not a set of programs, even though they are important. And it's not even people themselves just getting together. It is God's people on the move for Him. A healthy church has essential activity. We looked at Acts chapter 2. Prayer, the study of God's Word, the breaking of bread, giving to one another, and so on. And then we see that in a healthy church, opposition is viewed as opportunity. Rather than default to complaining or default to woe is me, why is this happening in my life, we default to the idea that God is presenting us with an opportunity. And then last Sunday, a healthy church has transformational moments. We looked at the life of Saul of Tarsus, a persecutor of the church of Jesus Christ. He was converted to Christ, he was baptized, and he began to make an impact on the world for the cause of Jesus Christ. He was transformed. I was transformed. Greg just testified of his transformation in his life. Ours are all different, but we can step back and say, God got a hold of me, and now I'm on a different road. And a church that's healthy is going to see that. It's going to see people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Today, I've entitled my message, A Healthy Church Has Clear Vision and Strategy. We're looking at the book of Nehemiah, if you will turn with me, please. Nehemiah chapter 1 through chapter 6. As we look at, uh, in my opinion, one of the great visionary and strategic leaders of all time. He was the cup-bearer to King Artaxerxes. And on this occasion, he had received word from people who had been returning from Jerusalem and sending the message of what it was like back in that city. And what he heard was that the walls of Jerusalem were in a pile of rubble. The walls of Jerusalem had been destroyed. And it says in verse 3 and following, They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been buried with fire, burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. What an appropriate response 
when we look out at the kingdom of God and we see things that they, the way it should not be, when we look at the American church and we see that it's kind of breaking down, it should cause us to weep. And so Nehemiah, for some days, I mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. I don't know as a pastor if I've prayed more for any singular thing more than the health of the American church. Because I've seen it breaking down in many sectors. I see the signs of a church that has gone astray across our land. A church that is putting the Bible gradually to the side and Jesus off of the centerpiece. And it breaks my heart. And you know, good things happen when our hearts are broken. You see, when God's people begin to come to Him with a brokenness of spirit and recognize the trouble we're in, then and only then do we then position ourselves to be consecrated to God. Then we begin to look at the answer to our trouble. And it's not in me. It's not in a program. It's not in a building. It's in a Savior. It's always been that way. This is nothing new for us. And yet we need to be refreshed by coming back to it. Because I think the American church is losing its way. Nehemiah, in a spirit of mourning, was serving wine to the king. That was his job. And on this particular occasion, the king noticed something different about Nehemiah. Nehemiah always, apparently, had a smile on his face. But on this occasion, his countenance was one of sadness, and the king noticed. And the king said to him, Why does your face look so sad? when you are not ill. This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. I'm going to ask you a real important question here this morning. I'm going to ask you to think of it in terms of the American church, but I also want you to think in terms of where you are at individually where Schroyer Road is at in its journey. Do you ever have those moments, and I'm not talking about depression, I, I, I'm not talking about anger, I'm not talking about frustration, I'm talking about what the New Testament refers to as a godly sorrow. My, my heart is broken. In a free land where everyone can have a Bible and everyone can go to church, our churches are often declining. Sorrow. It's a good thing. It's an appropriate thing. I don't think Nehemiah would have ever gotten off of dead center had he not started with sorrow in his heart. The king noticed that. And so Nehemiah said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Another man who wants to be an answer to his own prayer, Nehemiah says, King, send me. I want to talk for a little while about the word vision. Nehemiah, in the midst of his sorrow over the walls of Jerusalem, had a vision in his mind's eye 
of those walls being rebuilt. Remember what I've said repeatedly and I think is so important in my journey. If I cannot envision it, I will never pursue it. If I cannot see it in my heart, I will never chase after it and invest in it. Vision is the big picture. It is the destination. And Nehemiah could see the destination. He could see the city of Jerusalem in his heart. He could see the walls being built, the gates being restored, the rubble being removed, and God being glorified. If our sorrow doesn't produce great vision, where are we going? Because vision answers the question, where? Where are we going? Nehemiah knew. He prayed about it, and then he asked the king to go there. I need to go back to Jerusalem. I need to lead a group of people in rebuilding the walls. I want to be the answer to the solution of the problem. Vision. What does the Bible say about vision? Well, Nehemiah had a clear one, but here's what the Bible says. Where there is no vision, the people perish. That's King James. That's how I learned it when I was a child. But in the NIV it says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. This is helpful. <clears throat> if I don't have a vision from God, if I don't know the big picture and the destination of where I am going, I will be left without any constraints upon my life. I will be going here and there and everywhere. I'll be doing what you want, then what you want, and then what she wants, and then what he wants. Because I don't know where I'm going. The Bible describes God's people as sheep. And what do sheep have a tendency to do? They have a tendency to go astray, to cast off restraint, to just go their own separate ways. Sheep need a shepherd, and a shepherd provides a vision. And God, through his word and by his spirit, gives us vision for the future. And that vision gives us hope. It gives us direction. It gives us the promise of a fulfilled destination. Nehemiah had that vision. He could see it in his mind's eye. Can you? Well, that's part of the job of a preacher. But it's also each of our individual responsibility as we get into the Word every day. Because only through the Word of God and by His Spirit will we ever have a clear vision. We're not talking about something that is mysterious that someone else is going to come up with. We're talking about something that is clearly articulated in the Word of God. Schroyer Road Baptist Church has a future, but can you see it? Is it starting to become clear what that should look like? Without that vision, We're going nowhere. We simply go with the momentum of the downward decline of the modern church. It doesn't have to be that way. The life cycle of the church can be different than my personal life cycle. I'm going to die. Unless Jesus comes back in my lifetime, I'm going to die. But the church doesn't have to die. The church can thrive but only when it has vision. Vision. Do you have a big picture? Are you being lifted up above the fence? Can you begin to glimpse what God has designed the church to be? 
and then let's chase after it with all of our heart. Well, Nehemiah was a visionary leader, but he was also a very strategic leader. If you look down at uh, the end of chapter 2 and then into chapter 3, you begin to see the strategy of Nehemiah unfold. He saw that the city of Jerusalem was lying in ruins. But then he called God's people to the work of rebuilding that wall. Every good strategy calls God's people to do a work. A church takes work. Not just busy work, but God's work. Not just work that burns us out, but work that fulfills the soul. Work that actually satisfies because it is building the kingdom of God. Strategy talks about the plans and the methods that churches use to reach the vision God has given us. It answers the question, how are we going to get there? Have you ever known a visionary person who was not strategic? He has big dreams, but he never goes anywhere. Uh, I've known a number of those people over the years, uh, uh, but the individual that comes to mind is fictitious. From an old, old television show, The Honeymooners. Remember Ralph Cranden? Ralph was a man who was a visionary. He thought of great careers that he could have and great outcomes, but he had no strategy. He, he had no plan. And so Alice, his wife, was always dealing with the fact that her husband was a dreamer. But they were pipe dreams. It was a vision without a plan. There is a Bible character who was like that, one you know very, very well. His name was Moses. Moses had a vision. He could taste it in his mouth, a land flowing with milk and honey, a great, wonderful vision of a promised land. But one day, after going in circles in the desert for so many years, his father-in-law confronted him. In Exodus chapter 18, Jethro looked Moses in the eye and told Moses, what you are doing is not good. But just imagine, Moses was leading a million and a half people through the desert. Every day he was putting up with their complaining. Every day he would sit in a tent and try to mitigate their disputes. And on this particular day, he had his tent set up. He was sitting there acting as the arbitrator of all of the arguments going on. There was a line probably a mile long waiting for a hearing with Moses. And Jethro says, what you're doing, Moses, is not good. But I'm serving God's people. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a shepherd of God's people. I'm, I'm taking care of God's people. I'm loving the people. But Moses, you have the wrong strategy. And in fact, you have no strategy. You're a one-man show. A one-man show. What did Jethro say in chapter 18 of Exodus? He said to Moses, I want you to take this million and a half people and break it down into groups of 100, 50, 10, and I want you to go out and find capable men and put them as leaders over all those groups. You're not a one-man show. God didn't design it that way. Stop doing it. What you're doing 
is not good. You need a strategy. You got a great vision. But it ought not to take 40 years to get from Egypt to the promised land. Hello? When I was in college, I was a part of Campus Crusade for Christ uh, uh, a group at Northern Michigan University. And uh, Bill Bright was the president of uh, uh, Campus Crusade, and he often said that the goal of Campus Crusade in those days was to reach the world in our generation. To reach the world in our generation. Well, we didn't do it. And in the Western Hemisphere, we are moving further away from reaching that goal. The, the question isn't, you know, that the Bible isn't giving us a vision of a preferred future. It is. But oftentimes we don't have a plan. And without a plan, it's just a pipe dream. Forty years making circles in the desert instead of building the kingdom of God. Moses and that generation never arrived in the promised land. Thank God Moses mentored a young man named Joshua. And that young man would be used by God to take the people across the Jordan River and claim the promised land. It takes a plan. Joshua was a strategic leader and he carried that plan out. If you look at Nehemiah here, you see that he had a clear strategy. Look at chapter 3, starting in verse 2. Sorry, chapter 3, verse 7. Verse 7 begins with these two or three words, next to them. I want you to jump down to chapter 3, verse 17. Three words, next to him, verse 18, next to him, verse 19, next to him, verse 20, next to him, verse 21, next to him. You can read the entire chapter and over and over and over again. Next to him was another man with an assignment, a gate to rebuild, a piece of the wall to rebuild. Next to him was another one. This was a strategy. Nehemiah didn't just sit around having a dream of walls being rebuilt. He assigned people to jobs. And in the church of Jesus Christ, we have people with various spiritual gifts, with particular experiences and insights and, and uh, skills that God can use together to form the whole body of Christ. It takes a plan. It takes a plan. I haven't been with you long. But I've had enough interactions with you already to know that there is within our hearts a desire to see God do amazing things again. And yet, without a plan, it will just be a dream. And that's why we're doing the NCD survey. That's why we've developed a church health team that's why we're going through a lengthy assessment process so that we can, in the final analysis, develop an action plan based upon a portrait of a healthy church. If that's what it looks like, how do we get there? Let's get practical. Let's get down where everybody lives and begin to find out a way to take a church on a journey towards being healthier yet. Nehemiah is a great example of a leader who had vision and he had strategy. I want to take these moments today 
to be very personal. We are a part of a local church. We can sit here and talk about the American church or the global church, or we can talk about somebody else's church, but this is where we are. This is where God has planted us. And what a privilege that is. I don't believe you're here by mistake. I believe you're here as a part of the providential plans of God. You have known people who have come in recent years, and you have known people who have left. You understand that in every group of people there is water under the bridge. There are things in our own journey where I look back and I I wish I had done this differently or made a different choice. That's water under the bridge. Thank God for His grace, which is sufficient to cover everything in our journey. But this is where we are today. And we are God's people here for God's purposes. Do we have a clear vision? Where are we going? If somebody came to me and said, Steve, I hear you like to travel. Will you come with me? I'm taking a trip. I would have one question at least. And you would have the same question. Where are we going? Before I say yes, before I get on board your train, you have to tell me the destination. There are churches across America today scratching their heads, wondering why they are not seeing lives transformed and why they are not seeing people in their community coming to church. But many of those churches cannot tell those people what their destination is. They cannot tell them where this church is going. They cannot articulate a vision that is biblical. And unless we can do that, the pews will never be full. People will never seek a savior in that kind of church. We need clarity of vision. And the purpose of all of this preaching over these many weeks is to paint a portrait so that all of us understand what the Bible says about church health so that we can chase after it in a very strategic way. How are we going to get there? What's the plan? These things go together. And we're going to be talking a lot about them, certainly on the church health team. Vision and strategy are essential ingredients in a healthy church. Where a church has no vision, that church will perish. But where there is vision, it has to be biblical, and it has to be articulated clearly, and then we develop a plan that moves us in that direction. I get excited about these things. I kind of live and breathe in this world. I get excited because I've seen time and time again where when people get serious with God and they begin to see this not so much as building and program, but as a spiritual journey with Christ, and I consecrate my life to Him, God begins to do amazing things. You know, when he called Joshua, and even earlier back in the days of Moses, when he called them to step out into the river, he didn't part the water and then say, now go. He says, go. And then he parts the water. You and I cannot see tomorrow. You and I do not have the wisdom of God in its fullness. We only see in part. I cannot guarantee anything 
except this. God will not forsake us. God will go with us. And God's will will be done. I just want to be a part of that. Travel is exciting to me. I love going to new places. I, I love exploring new cultures. And I see a journey of a church towards the next level of health as that kind of an exciting journey. And I call upon you to join me. Not just join me on a Sunday morning, but join me in your spirit. Join me in your heart of hearts as you study the word, as you pray, as you consecrate your lives, because together we can watch God do amazing things. There is probably nothing in all the world I've cried more about than the health of the American church. Is your heart broken? Because I believe God's heart is broken. And will you determine not to allow that brokenness of spirit to morph into depression, anxiety, discouragement, frustration, or anger, but allow it to get you on your knees and consecrate your life to Christ again today? And will you allow God to give you a picture to lift you up above the fence. I refuse to keep looking through the knot hole. I grow weary of doing that. I get nowhere doing that. I can't see from moment to moment doing that. God lift me up. Pick me up out of the miry clay and stand me on that solid rock and give me a clarity of vision. I've been here long enough to make this declarative statement. We are not reaching our neighborhood for Jesus Christ. And it begins in my heart and yours to see amazing things happen. I don't even know how. Because we're not there yet. We haven't even seen where we are and assessed that, let alone where we need to go in terms of next steps. But I know this. God, fill me with a picture of a healthy church and let me be a part of making Schroyer Road Baptist as healthy as it can be. God bless you, as you are a very, very important piece of that. Uh, when I thought of uh, being away next Sunday, I, I tell you what, I'm already going to deeply miss being here. In fact, if I could do anything to change uh, this prearranged plan, I would do that because I have just come to uh, enjoy so much your kindred spirit, your love for God. And I, I just want to encourage you this morning put God out front. And we'll just follow him wherever he takes us. Father, it is with humility of heart. And maybe for many of us in this room with brokenness of heart. That we look to you and we say, here am I. Use me. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. But God, I'm willing to be the answer to my prayer. I'm willing to be the one to make a difference. 
Will you declare that in your heart this morning? You're not going to wait for somebody else. You're just going to determine in your own spirit that you're here to do God's will and to be used by God in whatever way He calls you.